Today is November 12, 2020. Now what's so significant about today's date? Well, today's the release of the long-awaited PlayStation 5. Now as I mentioned in past videos, I made a promise to myself that I would not get a PlayStation 5 just yet until February, which is actually my birth month. However, more power to those that would get it on day one. I look forward to seeing your videos as well as your reviews, as well as gameplay footages of the launch titles. However, the other thing that is significant about today's date is that today marks the end of my Road to PlayStation 5 Marathon. And we're ending this marathon with the PlayStation 4. Which doesn't need that much introduction, apart from the fact that it's the one console in the 8th generation era that has sold so many units magnificently and has earned the distinction of the second best-selling home console of all time. In addition, the PS4 not only has so many great games from the outset, but with each passing year, more titles and more great exclusives will come to the console, and they played so great that it's hard for me to decide what's considered my personal best for the console. So if there's a game that I didn't mention, it's not that I forgot about it, it's just that the library is just as diverse as the PS2, and many games for the PS4, I've yet to go so far or put many hours into it yet. And in today's video, I'll be naming my personal top 20 PlayStation 4 games. Why top 20? Why keep things on top 10 when you can double down? The road to PlayStation 5 ends with the PlayStation 4. Right here, right now on Top of the Game Chain. Just like my PS Vita countdown video, here are the rules for today's countdown that will be enforced. Again, one game per franchise with some exceptions. Two, games within the same series that play in different genres or subgenres will be counted. Three, imported games are allowed as the PS4 is region free. Four, compilations are allowed. Five, many games on the PS4 can also be multi-platform, so if I play the game first on the console, they will be counted. Six, Online only games will not be counted whatsoever as there's no telling when a game's popularity decreases and if the servers go down. So don't expect for games like Fall Guys to show up in this countdown as much as I want to. And finally, 7. This is not an official list whatsoever as these are just entries listed by me as a casual video game player. So again, don't take this list very seriously. So before we start this countdown, Here's my montage of some honorable mentions. We'll begin with a game that many say is very polarizing. From Kojima Productions is Death Stranding. This is the company's first game since going independent and I gotta say that in every trailer of the game being shown, I'll admit that the game is very weird and you don't get what the game is trying to tell you unless you play through the game and that's what Kojima usually does since Metal Gear Solid. His games will always have so much dialogue and cutscenes, not only to listen on how the plot goes, but also find subliminal messages on what his games are trying to tell us, and this game has so much to absorb, which to me is actually pretty clever. 
I will start by saying that I find this game's graphics to be very beautiful, from the landscapes to rendering the likeness of the celebrities that are in the game and how they will be animated. Speaking of animation, the game does a great job on the weather effects as well as special effects from when BTs start coming. The gameplay is not what everyone would have expected. Basically, you're delivering lost cargo to different colonies while also attempting to connect their networks for better communication right after the whole world has gone underground. I know many people don't like it, but I personally do enjoy the gameplay. I guess you could say it's more of a collectathon for the modern era, and as someone who has grown up playing those types of games, I'm actually used to it. However, the nation itself in the game is really big, and what I find great about this is that as you advance the story, you'll earn more ways to be creative on how you deliver your cargo, and there will be some action elements as well to provide more variety. As for sound presentation, the voice acting is very top-notch, especially from the main protagonist done by Norman Reedus. I mean, in any role he does, you can expect for him to play characters that are very stoic yet caring. Music in the game sounds beautiful, and they can vary depending on the situation, whether it gets intense or whether it sounds peaceful when in areas that are not too dangerous. I know I'll get some backlash from having this game on the list, but if you give it a chance and accept the game for what it is, I'm certain that you'll find some enjoyment out of it. I've stated in my last video that I didn't play much of the Uncharted series until I got my PS Vita and PlayStation 4, as I only watched walkthrough videos of the first three games. However, when people told me how great Uncharted 4's gameplay is, I thought I'd take their word for it, and thankfully, I'm glad I did. As with past games, you're in control of Nathan Drake, in search of treasure with his latest expedition has him finding the lost treasure of the English pirate Henry Avery. The gameplay has you going through several environments, moving through locations including towns, buildings, and jungles which I'll say they're designed beautifully, even in some areas like this where it has an open world feel to it and the atmosphere is very lively. Some people would think that the game is similar to that of Tomb Raider due to the similar premise with each game, as you can perform plenty of actions in order to traverse from one area to the next, not only to get the story going, but also find some hidden treasures to collect. The combat still remains the same as in past games, as you can either use stealth to take out your enemies, or be going out guns and projectiles of blazing, and the action is exhilarating. Sound presentation is what you expect from the series with great voice acting and the soundtrack having the thrill of adventure. With such a magnificent gameplay, this game is worth it and for PS5 owners, this game is also within the PS Plus collection, so you'll be in for hours of this great game. Speaking of the PS Plus collection, here's another one that's in the lineup, coming from one of my favorite action series, simply named Ratchet & Clank, the 2016 remake of the first game from 2002. As with all the games in the series, this game is all about them weapons that you get throughout the game and how much destruction you can make with them, and it's very satisfying along with the special effects when firing weapons causing great impact. The graphics of the game are amazing as the game did a great job of redesigning all of the set pieces that you remember from the original 2002 game. With planets having environments more expanded now than the original, that also means more objectives that you can do in the game. Mechanics that work in the second game and subsequent games in the series return such as gaining experience points to raise your maximum HP, weapons that would show up in later games after the original, and the weapon experience system which evolves with each level for extra firepower, which also opens up more branches for each weapon's ability tree, which can be upgraded with rare titanium. I don't think I need to go any further on explaining more of the game, if you've already played prior games in the series. But I will say that this remake is a great way of revitalizing the series, and it's worth getting yourself pumped before Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart comes out on PS5 soon. Long before the Soul series was popular, this fighting game from SNK Playmore revolutionized weapon-based combat, the Samurai Showdown series. So at number 17, we have the simply titled Samurai Showdown, or as some people call it, Samurai Showdown 2019. This is the series' first game in over 12 years, right after the not-so-good Samurai Showdown Sen on arcades and later the Xbox 360, in which, while the in-game models are good, the gameplay just flat-out sucked, and after coming off from that game, Samurai Showdown 2019 has the series going back to its roots, specifically, gameplay of Samurai Showdown 2 and 4. Unlike traditional fighters like Street Fighter or the King of Fighters, you don't just dive in head-first to deal damage to your opponent. 
you have to be sure that your opponent is open enough to strike back, and that's what makes this game good for what it is, as it's all about timing. Mechanics from past games return such as the rage meter as well as super moves that cause opponents to drop their weapons. As of this video, counting DLC, you have 28 characters to choose from, with many of the mainstays that fans of the series know over the years, along with some new faces joining the duel, and some characters that nobody expected to show up like those from Samurai Shodown 5, 6, and that awful Samurai Shodown 64 for the Hyper Neo Geo 64 arcade would be playable, which I actually welcome. The game plays at a nice frame rate, the visuals look wonderful, and so are the game's fantastic character models, and the game does well on the blood effects as that's the other thing that the series is known for. If this is your first time with the series, Samurai Showdown 2019 is a good game to start. I'll get this out of the way right now, I am not a fan of the rebooted Devil May Cry. I mean, I don't know what Capcom was thinking at the time, outsourcing the game and have this so-called Dante be very unlikable, along with its dumb story. Granted, I don't mind the gameplay that much, but it's sure as heck not Devil May Cry 3. Thankfully in 2019, Capcom did the right thing and the Demon Hunters are back in town for Devil May Cry 5. The game has you controlling Dante and the returning Nero from Devil May Cry 4 with a new playable and mysterious character simply known as V. The gameplay is similar to past titles, but maintains its fast-paced action, taking out various enemy demons with your assortment of weapons and skills, while keeping up with different combo varieties to keep up with your stylish grade. Dante still plays the same as it was in Devil May Cry 4, with all four styles being accessible to him at any time, with new weapons that are just downright weird. Nero now uses robotic arm weapons called Devil Breakers, each with their own different abilities, especially when one such arm that you can use is that of Mega Man's Mega Buster, assuming if you downloaded the DLC in the first place. As for V, his gameplay is unique as he doesn't fight physically. Instead, he uses the power of three demons he summons in the field to fight for him, long enough that V would deal the final blow with his silver cane. Capcom really went all out on not only making great graphics for the game, especially on the CG cutscenes, but also do very well on the sound presentation. I mean, Devil May Cry 3 had a rockin' soundtrack, but this one may have outshined it. This game is very fun to play and a great way to bring the series back to mainstream. And hey, as of this video, the special edition of the game is available, so if you got some extra bucks to spare, you might as well go get it anyway. Going from fast-paced action to taking things slow but have many surprises coming your way. We make a return to the chaotic zombie-infested town of Raccoon City in the 2019 remake of Resident Evil 2. The story is about the same as the original, but some plot points in the game are being retold differently. After seeing how great the gameplay was of Resident Evil 4, the over-the-shoulder view from that game will then be implemented to this game. However, many elements from the original RE2 would still be present in this game, such as finding some key items for puzzle solving and proceeding further with the story. You still have the option to select which character you want to start off with, and depending on who is selected, the story will have different variations in subplots, accessible areas, items and weapons that you can get just for that story, and different boss battles that you face. Just like the original, the game also has many unlockables, like a second run which is a variation of the main story, but with added plot elements among many other things. I don't think I need to explain the game any further, as the game is basically Resident Evil going back to its roots that fans love. Sorry folks, no Capcom title for the third time in this countdown. Don't get me wrong, I do enjoy Street Fighter V, but I find more love for this SNK Playmore game than King of Fighters XIV. I mean seriously, this game is so great to play, but sadly, the King of Fighters series hasn't really got that much love these days, apart from being referenced in Smash Ultimate, which really got today's generation of game players feeling clueless about it, because let's face it, SNK Playmore is more popular in South America, while Capcom and to an extent Bandai Namco dominate North America. What makes this one so great is the overall responsiveness. It's like you just copy and paste the gameplay of Street Fighter 4 and give it a King of Fighters paint job. Similarly to King of Fighters Maximum Impact, the game uses 3D character models on a 2D plane, and the character models are very smooth and defined. Counting DLC, the game has over 58 characters, and just like past games, you can select up to 3 characters to engage in team battles, but you can also play one-on-one -on -one modes as well. This game has 3 new mechanics. 
First is Max Mode, where characters can perform unlimited EX Special moves or stronger versions of level 1 super moves as long as the gauge allows it. Rush Combos, which allows players to create combos of special attacks, which leads to a super move if the super bar is filled. And finally, Climax Super Special Moves, which are basically level 3 super moves that deal about 75% damage. So if you're looking for an alternative to Street Fighter, King of Fighters 14 is a good choice. From a great cast of characters and very responsive gameplay, this game is a must-have. Twenty seventeen was a good year for everyone's beloved Mersupial, as he would make a big comeback in Crash Bandicoot and Saint Trilogy, a complete remake of all three PS1 Crash games. Needless to say, the redesigns of each game look amazing, adding more detail on the visuals and all the music redone for each game are composed well. However, of the three games, it's the first game that's still challenging, because now, if you're planning on getting gems for each stage, you can't die in stages with colored gems as the reward, and all the boxes in the Tana, Brio, and Cortex bonus stages will now count towards your box count, and the physics engine of Crash 2 and above doesn't really fit well with Crash 1, but it's still a good game nonetheless. As for the remakes of Crash 2 and 3, their gameplays are definitely one-to-one, -one, still retaining some of the familiar stage gimmicks and power-ups, and some of the secrets are easier to obtain. If by any chance you never experienced Crash Bandicoot firsthand, this is worth picking up as you get to own all three games at once. Even to this day, these games are still enjoyable. There's no way I'm making this countdown without having at least one Neptunia game, and thankfully, this one is just as enjoyable as the Rebirth Trilogy. Honestly, I'm not too sure how this title is pronounced, so to make it easier, here's Mega Dimension Neptunia Victory 2, the sequel to the third game. Neptune and the Seven Goddesses are back, and joining them are more new faces in game industry, including one of my new favorites being Uzume, who sure seems to love JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. The game still retains the same mechanics as in past games, such as dungeon exploration and attacking different monsters on the field to get the battle advantage, certain characters can transform into their stronger forms, and viewing other events to advance with the story. The combo system runs much better and in greater effect, since this game now runs at 60 frames per second. The EXE drive gauge makes its return to the game, possibly because of how broken Rebirth 3 is without it, and the four mainstays of the series now even have more stronger forms beyond their regular goddess forms and they look very astounding. Also in this game, taking a page from other traditional RPGs, random battles can also happen now when traveling in the world map, which will catch first-time players off guard, especially when in the few starting points of the game, some things you'll need to survive are scarce. I will say that the graphics in the game are beautiful, with many of them being new set pieces, the lighting effects are great, the animation is very fluid, and the stage designs and 3D models look even smoother than before. You'll definitely have a fun time playing this game, as there's just much things to do just like in the Rebirth trilogy. Just remember to also get the DLC for some extra help. When I played this game in Anime Expo years past, I knew that owning Tekken 7 was the best idea I've done, and to me, I think this is the most ambitious Tekken title to date, complete with a new story mode which is actually good, and some surprises. To keep it short, every mechanic that you know in Tekken 6 have been retained in this game. Only now, more gameplay elements have been introduced, which also involves the rage system from Tekken 6. One of which is the rage art, which is your desperation move, and Rage Drive, which is your quick combo similar to that of Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Counting DLC, the game has over 50 characters, and four of those characters are guest characters, which are Akuma from Street Fighter, Geese Howard from The King of Fighters, Noctis Loses Kylo from Final Fantasy XV of all things, and surprisingly, Negan from Image Comics The Walking Dead. And I gotta say, not only do they play well, but their designs are visually impressive. Aside from arcade and story modes, there are more items for character customization, and I'm glad to see the return of Tekken Ball mode. There's just so much fun to be had in Tekken 7 that if you haven't played it yet, now would be the right time to do it. Time for some old school platforming action starring the Blue Blur himself, Sonic the Hedgehog in Sonic Mania Plus. And this project has Sega let a group of independent game modders handle the whole game themselves, and the results are outstanding. The developer's idea of making this game is to have Sonic the Hedgehog return back to basics as a 2D platformer that fans come to know and love. This game sees the return of many stages from Sonic 1, 
2, 3 and Knuckles, and even Sonic CD with new original stages for this game. The game is very colorful, the stage designs are well crafted, very shiny, and fun to run through. Aside from your three mainstays, you also get to play as Mighty the Armadillo, whose last playable appearance is in Knuckles Chaotix for the ill-fated 32X in 1995, while Ray the Squirrel has not been playable since Sega Sonic the Hedgehog Arcade in 1993, making Sonic Mania Plus his console debut and it's fun to play as each character. To keep it short, the overall presentation is very solid, the gameplay definitely screams blast processing, and the game has one of the best soundtracks in the series. Very easy to pick up and play. Speaking of the Sega Genesis, here we have one brawler that just recently made a comeback this year, Streets of Rage 4. Again, to keep it short, everything that you know from the original Genesis trilogy are present in this game, from the controls, the special moves, and the combos that you can perform. In fact, the whole game is based upon Streets of Rage 2's foundation with some new mechanics. You now have a combo count, as well as you can juggle opponents in the air and against obstacles in order to earn extra points by connecting long combos as long as you don't take damage. Characters can also perform special moves in the air, and you can perform super techniques called star moves. You can even have up to 4 players offline. The game's graphics are done in cartoon-like style, which looks amazing with the amount of detail on the backgrounds, and the characters are drawn nicely and they animate exceptionally well. Also, the soundtrack done by both Olivier de Rivier and Yuzo Koshiro does a great job of blending 90s music with electronic music of today. With improved graphics, awesome new characters to play, great features, and nice unlockables, Streets of Rage 4 is worth having in your library and a great game to play with friends for some great old-school brawler action. This is one adventure game that any PlayStation 4 player shouldn't go without, which is Horizon Zero Dawn. Set in a post-apocalyptic world ruled by giant robots, and it's up to a hunter named Aloy to slay the robots and reclaim the land back to humanity. Aloy is equipped with a special headpiece, which allows her to see the weakness of each creature she comes across. Many of the goals in the game has Aloy hunting down robots in a variety of ways, such as setting up traps to disorient them and using her assortment of weapons to close in for the kill. Whenever you destroy a robot, you can loot their remains which you can use to craft different items and weapons to help you on your quest. However, it's not just robots that you face in the game, as you also face enemy humans like bandits that are out for blood, and the game also has a skill tree system in which you can gain new abilities among other benefits. I do find the design of the environments to be the most intriguing. First off, the game has very stunning visuals and has areas like forests, jungles, deserts, and snowy mountain regions that have very rich designs, which is a stark contrast to what an actual post-apocalyptic setting is. I'm not going to spoil the story that much as it's better for you to play the game yourself, and with the many side quests that you can participate in, this game is a must-have for the console, and I look forward to the sequel later next year. Speaking of post-apocalyptic settings, here's one from my favorite anime of all time, Hokuto no Ken. At number 7 is Fist of the North Star, Lost Paradise. This game is more of a retelling of Season 1 of the series, with many of the major battles from that season taking place, with some original events thrown in for this game. Unlike the Hokuto no Ken games from Koei Tecmo, this game plays in the Yakuza game engine, meaning you're not just charging towards your enemies head first and expect a quick finish. You have to know how to fight defensively and know when to strike, and just like Yakuza, quick time events come into play when you're given a button prompt to execute your signature moves. By obtaining different orbs in the game, you can use them to not only have Kenshiro learn some new signature moves, but also increase his overall performance. As the gameplay is basically Yakuza, only with a different coat of paint, you can expect the game to have side quests and mini games to participate, which will net you rewards for your succession. Taking the game's title into account, you can expect heavy amounts of violence, seeing many of the game's enemies be killed in numerous ways, just like in the show. And let me tell you, I wouldn't have it any other way. So if you're into Yakuza, I suggest also giving this game a try. I know that many people will be mad at me if the stylish RPG didn't make this countdown. Persona 5 Royal, an enhanced version of the original. 
Just like Persona 4 Golden, you're not just going through dungeons beating down every enemy that gets in your way. You're also taking part on day-to-day -day activities, not only to raise your attributes, but also improve social linking with other characters in the game in order to gain more benefits. When exploring dungeons, there's a security level that you have to be aware of, as enemies will be on patrol to be sure that you don't reach the end goal of your objective, or else you'll be kicked out of the palace. You can ambush the enemy from behind, and when you eliminate them, the alert level will go down. The battle system is the same as in Persona 4, with the only difference is that the system has a stylistic user interface that people seem to use it as an internet meme for some reason, and the ability to negotiate with demons in battle. However, that option is only available if all enemies in battle are stunned. By negotiating with demons, you'll be able to convince the chosen enemy to defect to your side and transform into a persona that you can summon, though you gotta make sure that your main character's level is equal to that of the demon or higher. Creating new persona is similar to that of Persona 4, only with more options to choose from. You can either sacrifice one to power up another, or keep a persona in the Velvet Room to power itself up until you're ready to take it to battle. This version of Persona 5 is an expansion of the original by adding a new character that would further extend the plot, along with additional personas, more scenes to view, extra scenarios, and more social links for more characters in the story. Yeah, I didn't get that far in the story, with only a few chapters in because this game is too long and I have other games in my agenda to play and review, but I will come back to this eventually. There's no need for me to explain the graphics and sound, as they already spoke for themselves as you play. For anybody that's planning on playing Persona 5, you might as well start on the Royal version for the complete experience. The only thing I'm wondering right now from Atlas is when the heck are we getting Persona 5 Scramble here in the US? I'm not going to import the game on account that I can't understand Japanese katakana for the life of me. Time to set foot into history as the civil war for conquering China rages on in Dynasty Warriors 8 Extreme Legends Complete Edition. I'm going to cheat a little bit from my own rules in this entry because originally I was going to add this game to my PS3 countdown list, but thanks to cross-saving, I would find myself playing the game a lot on my PlayStation 4. Dynasty Warrior 7 make up for the many mistakes the 6th game made and have the gameplay go back to its over-the-top action that made 2 through 5 so good, while also adding in the Kingdom of Jin scenario serving as the second half of the Kingdom of Wei storyline. Speaking of story mode, that's one of the great things about 8. With Extreme Legends, you have 5 major story modes to play, and you play through the first few battles historically, and by meeting some conditions, the stage selection would branch out to where you could choose playing through battles according to history, or play a kingdom's hypothetical route and see what happens when fates of characters have done a complete 180. The gameplay still remains the same as in 7. You can have your character equip any two weapons you want, however EX combo moves can only be performed with a weapon that's associated with that character. Characters can perform two Muso attacks on the ground and one in the air, but you gotta make sure you build up your chosen character first to unlock the other two Muso techniques. Returning from 5 is Rage Mode, which temporarily increases your stats significantly upon activation, and only on the ground will you unleash a hidden Muso technique while in that state. Another new battle mechanic is the 3 point system, where each weapon is given an affinity of Heaven, Earth, or Man, and each affinity is strong against one of the other affinities and weak against the other. This game has one of my favorite soundtracks in the series, the game is a great improvement from 7, and the replay value of the game is very high. I don't think there will ever be another good Dynasty Warriors game after this one, especially after what they did with Dynasty Warriors 9 by trying to be more realistic, a mistake they made the first time around with Dynasty Warriors 6. So until they can make a much better installment, stick with this one for now. People tend to have mixed feelings of this game, but personally for me, I play through this game each day until I defeat it, so Days Gone deserves a spot here in this countdown. That's 4 games in this countdown with a post-apocalyptic setting. Those seem to be popular in the console, aren't they? Anyway, as Deacon St. John, you'll be riding your bike all over the state of Oregon, trying to survive what's left of the world, and helping out survivors while doing all you can to take out zombie-like beings called Freakers, as well as other enemy humans that try to loot from him. Speaking of which, you'll be looting different types of items, whether for making some healing items or creating weapons that you can use against Freakers. 
You get experience points from killing enemies or completing a quest, and you get a skill point with each level up in order to improve Deacon's performance. By completing some side quests and also leveling up, you can gain more weapons to buy from a stronghold or buy some parts that you can use to improve your bike because you'll be traveling a lot in this game. The combat system is really good in this game. You can try to take out enemies with stealth kills or take them head on with your guns and some melee weapons that you can find in the game, and there are some plants and enemy strongholds that can help you craft even better weapons. I really dig the game's stunning visuals, as the state itself is known for having forested areas for hunting live game, and the country's songs are very soothing to listen to. The game will have some graphical hiccups every once in a while that after a simple reboot, you can pick up where you left off easily. I played this game for hours as it was hard for me to put down, and it's one game I'll definitely replay again because I wholeheartedly enjoyed it. If those that got a PS5 never played this game yet, you're in luck because this game is also part of the PS Plus Collection lineup. I just had to make sure that this great fighting game makes this countdown because in my opinion, Dragon Ball Fighters is what I consider a Marvel vs. Capcom killer, and rightfully so because DBC Fighters is what Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite should have been. I mean 3 on 3 fights, fast paced mechanics, characters with devastating moves, many abilities from the show that are placed in the game, and a good roster, need I say more? Oh yes I can because there's the dynamic camera angles when performing moves or sending your opponent impacting to a building or structure, the great use of the Guilty Gear Excerpt engine, and all the colorful and lively visuals, it's no wonder why it received fighting game of the year. DBC Budokai 3 was considered the best Dragon Ball fighting game at the time, but DBC Fighters excelled all other fighting games in that series, so I suggest getting this game for the console as the overall presentation of this game is very worthwhile. This game may have only been 4 months old, but holy freaking cow, this game is immediately an instant classic. From the makers of Sly Cooper and Infamous comes Ghost of Tsushima, based off actual history of the Mongolians' invasion of Japan in 1274, way long before the infamous Sengoku era. You're in control of a samurai named Jin Sakai, head of the Sakai clan, who was able to escape death following the Japanese forces' defeat by the Mongolians. After his uncle was held captive, Jin meets up with various characters in the game and little by little he will learn some techniques that are out of character for a samurai if he hopes to save his uncle and his nation. Ghost of Tsushima is both an action adventure game as well as a stealth game. You ride on horseback not only discovering different locations around the island but also take part on side quests that'll help Jin feel ready and build up his reputation. When exploring freely, you can pick up some materials on the grass fields or some items from abandoned villages that'll help power up your equipment. You'll get experience points by either killing enemies or completing a quest, and because of the open world setting, there are many side quests to take, and by leveling up, you can use your skill points to upgrade Jin's abilities in combat to make it easier for you. As for fight mechanics, you can approach your enemies and call them out for a fight and take them out with your melee weapons as well as your sub-weapons to stagger them and get in close for the kill. Close quarters combat is very responsive and enemies can give you an indication on whether you can parry an attack or dodge it enough that you can counterattack. Or you can do the other method by taking out enemies with stealth, which is very useful if you want to take on enemy strongholds easily without being surrounded by so many enemies. This design choice is perfect for a game like this as it gives you freedom on how you want to complete your quest and make Jin stronger. It's even great on the fact that you could set up waypoints when you want to ride to your desired location. The visuals of the game are very beautiful as it captures the actual countryside of the nation. It does a great job of the weather effects, especially when using the wind to guide you to your destination, and the atmosphere is full of life. The setting of the game gives you the feel of very old samurai movies like Seven Samurai that even at the start of the game, it asks if you want to play the game in black and white filters with Japanese dialogue and even says that it pays respect to the late famed director and producer Akira Kurosawa, which is a nice tribute. The multiplayer game, Ghost of Tsushima Legends, plays just as good as the real game. You can play any chapter you want, either by yourself or with other online players and complete the chapter to gain extra items and build out the ranks of each class. This is why I spend most of the time when I boot up the game and if I don't feel like going far with the main campaign just yet. 
In fact, I haven't really gotten that far, as I don't want to spoil the story for those that haven't started on it yet. Overall, a very epic experience that, for anybody who is getting a PS5, you might want to throw in some extra dollars for this game because it's worth investing so much hours into it. So for number one, I think we can agree on what game is taking it. Yep, I'm sure people would see this coming. I mean, there's no disputing the fact that Marvel's Spider-Man is not only the absolute best in the console, but also the greatest superhero game today. I don't think I need to explain the summary of this kick-butt game. In fact, I'll let the montage of the game speak for itself. That's right, it's that spectacular, and if you haven't played it yet, I'd say get the game and start on it right away. Everything both Spider-Man 2 the movie game and the Batman Arkham games can do, this game brings the best of both worlds, and hey, with the release of Spider-Man Miles Morales, means more web-swinging action. A real masterpiece and definitely deserves the number one spot in this countdown. And there you have it folks! My personal top 20 PlayStation 4 games. Do you like what you see in the countdown? What games on the console do you consider your favorites? Let me know in the comments down below. <sighs> well, that ends the Road to PlayStation 5 Marathon. It was definitely a big project indeed, but I kept my word and actually made this project happen. I think I'm going to take a little bit of a break from PlayStation and focus on other consoles later down the road for top of the game chain. Anyway, I hope you viewers like this video, and if you find this video interesting, as well as other contents in my channel, feel free to subscribe to my channel at any time if you haven't done so yet, as well as follow me on social media. Until then, this has been Musashi X, and I bid you all farewell. Take care, and stay tuned.